At Griffles, we've pioneered the research of blood and the therapeutic properties of plasma for over a century. Blood courses throughout our bodies. Its liquid part, plasma, constitutes about 55% of its total volume and contains proteins of incalculable value. Several rare and chronic conditions affecting millions of patients are caused by deficits of some of these proteins. Thanks to the generosity of donors, we develop medicines derived from plasma that help millions of patients globally. Our ongoing studies are evaluating the efficacy of plasma therapies for the treatment of high prevalence conditions such as cirrhosis and Alzheimer's disease and the management of emerging infectious diseases like COVID-19 and Ebola. Since 1909, Griffles has defined the field of hemotherapy with advances such as the first indirect transfusions in Spain and the development of plasmapheresis, a technique that remains the industry standard used for plasma collection. Empowered by this legacy of innovation, Griffles now distributes its products and services in more than 100 countries and regions, with a presence in over 30. Griffles develops, produces, and markets innovative solutions and services through four business divisions. As leaders in the production of plasma-derived medicines, we ensure a reliable and consistent source of plasma medicines worldwide. We develop solutions and tools to help improve disease detection and transfusional safety, and to support process management in hospital pharmacies. Griffles also supplies high-quality biological materials for life science research and product manufacturing. Our in-house engineering is a hallmark in the sector. We employ cutting-edge technology across our production plants worldwide, which include one of the largest plasma fractionation sites in the industry. Since the beginning, ethical leadership and social commitment have paved our historic journey, which is celebrated in our museum. We believe our employees are the true drivers of our growth and innovation, and we take great pride in the diversity of our global family. We are responsible stewards of the environment, protecting the biodiversity of natural habitats on our properties and minimizing our impact on the planet. Through our foundations, we foster research in bioethics, distribute humanitarian aid, and back educational programs. Griffles is always on the front lines. We work to find new solutions to the healthcare challenges of the 21st century, promoting scientific research and expanding our footprint to deliver care and support more broadly. Today, Griffles continues to grow inspired by the rigor and passion of a team of individuals that shares the same values as our founder. Together, we are committed to a mission that has endured for over a century, to improve the health and well-being of people around the world. At Griffles, we've pioneered the research of blood and the therapeutic properties of plasma for over a century. Blood courses throughout our bodies. Its liquid part, plasma, constitutes about 55% of its total volume and contains proteins of incalculable value. Several rare and chronic conditions affecting millions of patients are caused by deficits of some of these proteins. Thanks to the generosity of donors, 
we develop medicines derived from plasma that help millions of patients globally. Our ongoing studies are evaluating the efficacy of plasma therapies for the treatment of high prevalence conditions such as cirrhosis and Alzheimer's disease and the management of emerging infectious diseases like COVID-19 and Ebola. Since 1909, Griffles has defined the field of hemotherapy with advances such as the first indirect transfusions in Spain and the development of plasmapheresis, a technique that remains the industry standard used for plasma collection. Empowered by this legacy of innovation, Griffles now distributes its products and services in more than 100 countries and regions, with a presence in over 30. Griffles develops, produces, and markets innovative solutions and services through four business divisions. As leaders in the production of plasma-derived medicines, we ensure a reliable and consistent source of plasma medicines worldwide. We develop solutions and tools to help improve disease detection and transfusional safety, and to support process management in hospital pharmacies. Griffles also supplies high-quality biological materials for life science research and product manufacturing. Our in-house engineering is a hallmark in the sector. We employ cutting-edge technology across our production plants worldwide, which include one of the largest plasma fractionation sites in the industry. Since the beginning, ethical leadership and social commitment have paved our historic journey, which is celebrated in our museum. We believe our employees are the true drivers of our growth and innovation, and we take great pride in the diversity of our global family. We are responsible stewards of the environment, protecting the biodiversity of natural habitats on our properties and minimizing our impact on the planet. Through our foundations, we foster research in bioethics, distribute humanitarian aid, and back educational programs. Griffles is always on the front lines. We work to find new solutions to the healthcare challenges of the 21st century, promoting scientific research and expanding our footprint to deliver care and support more broadly. Today, Griffles continues to grow inspired by the rigor and passion of a team of individuals that shares the same values as our founder. Together, we are committed to a mission that has endured for over a century, to improve the health and well-being of people around the world. At Griffles, we've pioneered the research of blood and the therapeutic properties of plasma for over a century. Blood courses throughout our bodies. Its liquid part, plasma, constitutes about 55% of its total volume and contains proteins of incalculable value. Several rare and chronic conditions affecting millions of patients are caused by deficits of some of these proteins. Thanks to the generosity of donors, we develop medicines derived from plasma that help millions of patients globally. Our ongoing studies are evaluating the efficacy of plasma therapies for the treatment of high prevalence conditions such as cirrhosis and Alzheimer's disease and the management of emerging infectious diseases like COVID-19 and Ebola. 
Since 1909, Griffles has defined the field of hemotherapy with advances such as the first indirect transfusions in Spain and the development of plasmapheresis, a technique that remains the industry standard used for plasma collection. Empowered by this legacy of innovation, Griffles now distributes its products and services in more than 100 countries and regions, with a presence in over 30. Griffles develops, produces, and markets innovative solutions and services through four business divisions. As leaders in the production of plasma-derived medicines, we ensure a reliable and consistent source of plasma medicines worldwide. We develop solutions and tools to help improve disease detection and transfusional safety, and to support process management in hospital pharmacies. Griffles also supplies high-quality biological materials for life science research and product manufacturing. Our in-house engineering is a hallmark in the sector. We employ cutting-edge technology across our production plants worldwide, which include one of the largest plasma fractionation sites in the industry. Since the beginning, ethical leadership and social commitment have paved our historic journey, which is celebrated in our museum. We believe our employees are the true drivers of our growth and innovation, and we take great pride in the diversity of our global family. We are responsible stewards of the environment, protecting the biodiversity of natural habitats on our properties and minimizing our impact on the planet. Through our foundations, we foster research in bioethics, distribute humanitarian aid, and back educational programs. Griffles is always on the front lines. We work to find new solutions to the healthcare challenges of the 21st century, promoting scientific research and expanding our footprint to deliver care and support more broadly. Today, Griffles continues to grow inspired by the rigor and passion of a team of individuals that shares the same values as our founder. Together, we are committed to a mission that has endured for over a century to improve the health and well-being of people around the world. At Griffles, we've pioneered the research of blood and the therapeutic properties of plasma for over a century. Blood courses throughout our bodies. Its liquid part, plasma, constitutes about 55% of its total volume and contains proteins of incalculable value. Several rare and chronic conditions affecting millions of patients are caused by deficits of some of these proteins. Thanks to the generosity of donors, we develop medicines derived from plasma that help millions of patients globally. Our ongoing studies are evaluating the efficacy of plasma therapies for the treatment of high prevalence conditions such as cirrhosis and Alzheimer's disease and the management of emerging infectious diseases like COVID-19 and Ebola. Since 1909, Griffles has defined the field of hemotherapy with advances such as the first indirect transfusions in Spain and the development of plasmapheresis, a technique that remains the industry standard used for plasma collection. Empowered by this legacy of innovation, Griffles now distributes its products and services in more than 100 countries and regions with a presence in over 30.
Griffles develops, produces, and markets innovative solutions and services through four business divisions. As leaders in the production of plasma-derived medicines, we ensure a reliable and consistent source of plasma medicines worldwide. We develop solutions and tools to help improve disease detection and transfusional safety, and to support process management in hospital pharmacies. Griffles also supplies high-quality biological materials for life science research and product manufacturing. Our in-house engineering is a hallmark in the sector. We employ cutting-edge technology across our production plants worldwide, which include one of the largest plasma fractionation sites in the industry. Since the beginning, ethical leadership and social commitment have paved our historic journey, which is celebrated in our museum. We believe our employees are the true drivers of our growth and innovation, and we take great pride in the diversity of our global family. We are responsible stewards of the environment, protecting the biodiversity of natural habitats on our properties and minimizing our impact on the planet. Through our foundations, we foster research in bioethics, distribute humanitarian aid, and back educational programs. Griffles is always on the front lines. We work to find new solutions to the healthcare challenges of the 21st century, promoting scientific research and expanding our footprint to deliver care and support more broadly. Today, Griffles continues to grow inspired by the rigor and passion of a team of individuals that shares the same values as our founder. Together, we are committed to a mission that has endured for over a century to improve the health and well-being of people around the world. Blood courses throughout our bodies. Its liquid part, plasma, constitutes about 55% of its total volume and contains proteins of incalculable value. Good evening, colleagues and friends. Today, we have an update on Pond Villebrand disease. This webinar is brought to you by Mumbai Hematology Group. It is supported by Griffalls and managed by Mice Ideas. I thank Mr. Anish Sapre and his team from Griffos, Mr. Rajesh Sharma, Mr. Kalpesh and their team from Mice Ideas, the Executive Committee of Mumbai Hematology Group, our faculty and you participants for sparing your Friday evening. Before we proceed further, I request the team management to show us a small video on behalf of Griffos. A legacy of more than a century of innovation empowers us to design in-house technological solutions and build state-of-the-art manufacturing facilities recognized widely for their excellence. Since the beginning, ethical leadership, social commitment, and a passion for science have paved our journey. As we continue to grow, we work to find new solutions to the healthcare challenges of the 21st century and remain committed to our mission of improving the health and well-being of people around the world.
in today's webinar we have two parts first the lecture on villebrand disease diagnosis and management this will be given by me unfortunately dr chandra is not available because of some problems on personal level and therefore this replacement last minute this will be followed by a panel discussion on villebrand disease and the subject is where are we now and what does the future hold this will be moderated by our friend dr cecil ross who is professor of medicine head hematology at st john's bangalore and the panelists will be dr jagdish chandra from delhi dr tufan dolai from kolkata dr mukul agarwal from delhi dr radhika from hyderabad dr philip from tiruvalla and dr balar from surat we begin with a lecture on diagnosis and management of vwd vwd is the commonest of the inherited bleeding disorder its prevalence is almost 1 to 2% of the general population and that may be amazing to an undergraduate student however majority of them almost never come to a clinician so if we talk about the clinically relevant cases then its prevalence is similar to that of hemophilia a and even then because the problem of von willebrand disease is much less than that of hemophilia a especially in the form of chronic arthropathies it overall appears which is a vitiated impression it overall appears that von willebrand disease is less common than hemophilia von willebrand disease was first described almost about a century ago 100 years ago in 1926 by a finnish pediatrician eric von willebrand who used a robot to make the house calls to see the patients and the family of von willebrand disease in island off the shore of finland called aland islands that's eric von willebrand on the right side that's finland here and there's other islands where he would visit with a boat to see those family members who were bleeders both males and females and hence he distinguished them from classical hemophilia which didn't affect females and this was in 1926 this is relative frequency of inherited bleeding disorders from iran what you see over here is von willebrand is the commonest the blue pie and then hemophilia a and then because they had a large number of work done with iranians there was factor 11 and then hemophilia b and then the platelet disorders and others now as far as india is concerned the commonest disorders are von willebrand disease factor 8 factor 9 and factor 13 because of the consanguinity now vwf is a large multimeric glycoprotein it has a very large gene snapping 170 at kb on chromosome 12 where is von willebrand factor synthesized it is synthesized at two sites the vascular endothelium and the megaphagocytes and then this factor is stored in this wp bodies from where it is secreted into plasma now one can have a quantitative deficiency of vw factor or a qualitative abnormality in the vw factor based on this we divide them into three types the type 1 is partial quantitative deficiency where factor is low and type 3 where factor is almost absent and the type 2 where the factor is there but it is not functioning properly overall von willebrand factor has got two important functions to perform in the hemostasis first is related to the platelets so it's a very important protein which puts the platelets to the subendothelial tissue if you don't have von willebrand factor the platelets will not adhere to the collagen in the subendothelium the large multimers of the von willebrand factor are most important for this platelet activity the second important part of von willebrand factor is that it's a carrier protein of factor 8 if there is no von willebrand factor although you will produce enough factor 8 but the life of the factor 8 will be very very shortened 
it will be destroyed in no time. So this is very important to have the VWF to maintain the factor VIII in the body. So the bleeding is also of two types. The one which is related to what will be called thrombopathy, where there is a mucosal bleeding and menorrhagia, just like any other platelet dysfunction like Glanzmann's. And the second one will be like hemophilia. So bleeding into the joints, bleeding into the muscles or the post-op bleeding. So that's the first part of the von Willebrand factor where there is a receptor on the platelet. There's a receptor in the subendothelium and it causes addition of the platelet to the injured vessel wall to the subendothelium. And this is through its large multiples. And then that's the second role, von Willebrand factor carrying the factor eight on its shoulder. And that sort of von Willebrand factor and the factor eight unit in which it circulates in the body. Both have got complex structure. Von Willebrand factor is a multimer, as you can see this. And Adam TS13, as we know, cuts these various kind of monomers and dimers. So this is a dimer, this is a monomer, and that's a multimer. If there is no Adam TS13, you have this large multimer circulating, leading to disorders like thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura. So you have understood that there is type one partial deficiency where the VWF is five to 30%, type two, which is a qualitative abnormality, and type three, where there's a total deficiency with decreased levels of factor eight, if not totally absent. And type two is further divided into four, A, B, M, N. Now to understand them simply, as far as the type two is concerned, there is a decreased platelet binding, but there's a loss of this high molecular weight multiples. Type two B also, there is a loss of this high, uh, uh, multivers, but there is an increased platelet binding. So the type A, 2A and 2B both have deficiency of the multimers, heavy molecular weight multimers, but one has got decreased platelet binding and in the B there is an increased platelet binding. The M has got adequate multimers. So this is how the M for multimers and A and B, there's a paucity of multimers. And lastly, the N, what is for Normandy, which is a place in France, there's a decreased binding to factor eight. So the factor eight levels are there. So this is how there are four types of type two. How is von Willebrand disease inherited? It's an autosomal inheritance in which one and two are dominant and three is autosomal recessive. Overall, there are more than 250 types of mutations, various types of mutations. And that is a little difficulty in doing the diagnosis of this entity by simple methods. And today we have NGS, which can give you all these mutations. So this is a summary, type one, type two, A, B, M, N, and type three. So this is partial quantitative deficiency. This is severe or complete deficiency. And in between you have this A, B, M, N, in which A and B, there is a lack of large multimers. Lack of large multimers. M, there is no deficiency of multimers. And N, there is a deficiency of factor eight. Autosomal dominant, autosomal dominant, autosomal recessive. Now, what's the relative incidence of these three types? So, if once again, if you take the data from Iran, type one is the commonest, over 90%. Type two, is about 8%, type three is very rare, just 1%. As against this, if you take the data from India, and this is data from Delhi, you see that the type three is 8%, type two is 66%, type one is 25%. And the reason for that is not very difficult to understand, but these are hospital-based data. So those who bleed tremendously come more often to you. Those who don't bleed much don't come to you. So it appears, it is all vitiated. The type one is not so common in India and type three is very common in India. If you look at the clinical profile, which I've already mentioned to you that there is mucosal bleeding and there is a hemophilia type of bleeding, but there's a difference in what happens at a different age group. This is under five, this is five to 15, and this is adolescent and adults. 
So what you see is that the epistaxis and oral bleeding is commonest in small kids and it decreases with age. The joint bleeding starts coming up with aging and GI bleeding because of development of angiodysplasia. One willebrand factor is very important to prevent the angiodysplasias from developing. Now that develops with the aging and therefore people who are in 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s have increasing incidence of GI bleeding, not directly due to von Willebrand disease, but because of the angiodysplasias. So how do you diagnose this condition? First of all, though the screening test is PTT, normal PTT does not exclude von Willebrand disease at all because there are so many minor variants where PTT is not abnormal. Now, in, when I was a student or I was a resident in 1980s, the diagnosis was based on clinical picture, which was like mucosal bleeding, platelet type of bleeding with hemophilia type of bleeding, autosomal inheritance, so females being involved, low levels of factor eight, say 5%, 10%, 20%, and we used to do bleeding time. And if that was increased, so clinical picture, autosomal inheritance, low level of factor eight, increased bleeding time, we would call a patient spawn deliverance disease. Now, on the turn of the century, the things have changed. Today, you have availability of VWF AG, VWF Recoff, and even the binding of the VWF to the collagen. And these three tests have become widely available in majority of the institutions having hematology department. Research labs also have the facility to investigate for VWF binding to factor eight and also to carry out the multimeric analysis of VWF. Now, these are not available even in institution hematology department. In Mumbai, Mumbai, we are lucky. NIH does this. This is very important to subtype the VWD exactly, and we will see what is the impact of knowing the exact subtype on the treatment of von Willebrand disease. So what you see on the right side is the multimeric analysis. On the upper part, you see the heavy or the large Multiples on the lower side, you see the lower weight multiples. Bleeding time has been discarded because it is neither sensitive nor specific. This got replaced by platelet function analyzer, as you see on the right side, and these are there in many institutions in India. But that also gives you a variable sensitivity and specificity. And therefore, VWF Recoff and its collagen binding activity are the most reliable artificial surrogates for the platelet dependent function of the von Willebrand disease. And that tells you whether the capacity of von Willebrand to make the platelet adhere to the subendothelium is good or bad. So bleeding time, yesterday, platelet function analyzer in many institutions even today, and VWF recoff and collagen binding are the test if you want to assess the platelet function of von Willebrand factor. The preoperative assessment of VWF AG is of very little help in predicting the bleeding in type 1 von Willebrand disease, which is the commonest. Then you also have this test, RIPA, Ristocetin induced platelet aggregation, which is abnormal or deficient in all types except 2B, where it is high tech. The last, the most important part of my talk is the management. As far as the general principles of management are concerned, in von Willebrand disease, as in hemophilia, the mainstay of treatment is the replacement. Both when there is a spontaneous bleeding and when you want to invade the body. So as you replace factor eight for factor uh, hemophilia A, factor nine for hemophilia B, here also the mainstay of the treatment is to replace the factor. Now, as against hemophilia, regular prophylaxis is not common in von Willebrand disease. And the reason for that is here the bleeding tendency is less severe. For this not norm that you keep giving them in a prophylactic phase. Except type 3. Here you can get exactly what happens in hemophilia, including hemarthrosis and also in patients who start developing GI tract bleeding, where of course you have some other alternative treatment as well. Now in hemophilia A and B, factor eight and factor nine deficiency, the choice of treatment and the dose is based on close relation 
among the factor 8 and factor 9 contents in the replaced material and what happens after giving them to the plasma levels and how effective it is in controlling the bleeding so what you give how much you give is based on what does that factor contain how much it contains what happens after you give and how effective it is in controlling the bleeding now this kind of equation is not really very very closely related in von willebrand disease because we still do not know what is the best lab technique which can correlate best with the severity of bleeding and to tell you that your treatment is not underdone or overdone plasma factor 8 is the most important determinant as far as the surgical patients are concerned and if there are muscular hemorrhages in von willebrand disease the plasma factor 8c levels but again it's not clear which measurement is most important determinant as far as the mucosal bleeding is concerned like menorrhagia gi oral anus little information exists about the level of histocytic cofactor or collagen binding and their criticality for controlling the mucosal and the surgical bleeding now coming to the exact treatment so you have a drug desmopressin which can induce autologous production of factor 8 and von willebrand which is unique to the treatment of von willebrand disease and also used for mild hemophilia and then you have exogenous administration of the factors and the most important the most widely used in india and all over the world is derived from the plasma and in that there are two types the one which is most widely prevalent again all over the world and in india is the plasma product containing both factor 8 and von willebrand while there is another plasma derived concentrate which contains von willebrand factor only this is not widely available not available in india at all but we will discuss this and then like factor 8 we also have recombinant von willebrand factor which contains only recombinant von willebrand no factor 8 at all once again not available in india not available in many parts of the world but all these have been approved in europe and us there is a role of platelet concentrate and we will see that and then there are adjuvant therapies which are equally important like anti fibrinolytics tranexamic acid being the most popular 50% of patients are women so this is predominantly a disease of women who have lifelong menorrhagia and pph so oral pills and then mirena which is a hormonal intrauterine device and then a word or two about the managing the angiodysplasia of gi tract and lastly there is an entity like acquired von willebrand disease which i don't think we'll have time to discuss now desmopressin which can induce your own von willebrand factor and factor 8 production or liberation it is 1d amino 8d arginine vasopressin it's a synthetic derivative of adh anti diuretic hormone and it acts through vasopressin receptor and that's the vial in normal people in patients who have mild hemophilia and in von willebrand disease it liberates the preformed factor 8 and von willebrand disease and thus raises the plasma level of both a desmopressin can be given intravenously and that's the preferred mode subcutaneously and by nasal spray route. the advantage of desmopressin is that one you are producing auto production of the factor two it is low cost therapy and three the plasma products can be avoided the dose is 0.3 microgram per kg given as continuous infusion over 30 minutes or of course it can be given subcutaneously it can push the level of factor 8 and von willebrand by 3 to 5 times the baseline overall iv is preferred it acts instantaneously in patients who have got acute bleeding and before the surgery it is given two or three times in a day because the effect lasts only for 6 to 8 hours nasal spray can be used as prophylaxis or self therapy at home now not all patients of von willebrand disease can be helped with desmopressin it's most effective in type 1 it is not recommended overall in type 2 because it will lead to production of a defective von willebrand factor 
it's contraindicated in type 2b because it can lead to increased platelet activity it's totally ineffective in type 3 because there is nothing there to be liberated and this is what happens say when you give it in type 1 von willebrand antigen levels 1 3 and 5 to 6 hours after giving desmopressin it has some adverse effects in the form of tachycardia headache facial flushing it can lead to seizures and hyponatremia because it retains water in the body also quickly tachyphylaxis develops and the effect wears off so you can't use it for controlling or producing hemostasis for more than 3 4 days it is contraindicated in patients having ischemic heart disease because because it liberates your auto factor it has also has the ultra large multimers and they will lead to aggregation of the platelets and can precipitate a myocardial infarction the worst of the problem is for last few years it's just not available anywhere in the world not available in india not available in italy not available in us so this shortage of lack of production of desmopressin is a huge setback and the hemophilia community is not able to convince the pharma company to produce it you have the nasal spray available which endocrinologists use which is a poor alternative to the iv we come to i think the most important part of today's discussion the allogenic replacement therapy that is replacing factor from somebody else's body now plasma and you will be surprised but in 1970s i have used plasma plasma contains both factor 8 and von willebrand but the quantity will be 20 to 30 ml per kg this will soon lead to volume overload and you just can't achieve the hemostatic level when i became a resident we you started using cryoprecipitate that contains both factor 8 and von willebrand volume is less you can achieve normalization of the levels and bleeding can be stopped and we used it for almost 10 15 years when i was resident and even started my practice the problem is this factor is not virus inactivated and therefore there is a huge risk of transmitting hiv hbc gene and cv that brings us to the modern treatment of von willebrand disease by replacement that is virus inactivated plasma concentrates containing factor 8 and von willebrand these are the safest and the most preferable and that is what we are using for last 10 to 15 years these are available as fendi and coit from griffols and a vial contains 500 and 1000 units worldwide including india these are the products which are used for treating or preventing bleeding in von willebrand disease both fendi and coits have been evaluated extensively in clinical studies they contain von willebrand factor to factor 8 in the ratio of approximately 1 is to 1 the label on these products expresses the potency of both von willebrand factor ecof and factor 8c many studies indicate that the commercial concentrates that contain both von willebrand and factor 8 are highly efficacious it's extremely important that the von willebrand factor when you replace then its activity is by increasing the level of factor 8 and you are giving it simultaneously if you give a product that contains highly purified von willebrand factor it will take time for endogenous factor 8 to link with it and become effective so that fact that kind of concentrate will not be effective in emergencies a factor 8 concentrated which are highly purified say for example something which does not contain von willebrand factor at all or the recombinant factor 8 will be a very poor choice for treating von willebrand disease because basically you want to replace the von willebrand factor with or without factor 8 these concentrates undergo triple viral inactivation solvent detergent dry heating and nanofiltration so they are extremely safe with compared to cryo and plasma so that's the dose schedule simple major surgery 50 units per kg minor surgery 40 units per kg dental extraction 30 units per kg spontaneous bleeding episodes 20 to 30 units per kg and for delivery and puerperium 40 units per kg now most of the time you give them daily but for minor you can give it on alternate day for dental extraction you just require one dose and for delivery and puerperium you give it daily until delivery of course near the delivery and then in the postpartum period because you must remember 
that factor 8 and polyvalent factor are heightened during the pregnancy and these levels precipitously drop after the delivery, especially by day 3 and day 4. The goals are that the drug level of factor 8 should be more than 50%. And this should be maintained till the healing is complete. So for major surgery, 5 to 10 days. Drug level more than 30 for minor surgery for 2 to 4 days. Drug level more than 50 just for about 12 hours for dental extraction. Drug level more than 30% till the bleeding stops. And drug level more than 50 for at least 3 to 4 days after the delivery. The average dose of concentrate shown in the previous table are for controlling or preventing different type of hemorrhages with factor level less than 10%. So it's presumed that a patient of von Willebrand disease, his own factor level is less than 10%. And based on that, those levels were mentioned in the previous table. But if your own level is 20% or 30% or 40%, then obviously you have to reduce the doses because if you still give the same doses, you may heighten the levels to 200% or 300% and that can lead to thrombosis. How do you do the lab monitoring? After administering these products, factor 8C activity should be assayed every 12 hours for the first day and every 24 hours after that. It can also be monitored by looking at the recoff. The peak and the drug levels of recoff needed to achieve and maintain the surgical hemostasis are identical to that of factor C, factor 8C. Those patients where hemorrhage is not adequately controlled despite good level of factor C that we, factor 8C that we talked about, a platelet concentrate can be used. Transfused normal platelets are effective because they transport and localize the VWF from the rapidly flowing blood into the sites of vascular injury. Now I will talk about those two products which are not available in India, not available in most part of the world. One is plasma derived von Willebrand factor only. That means not containing factor eight. Available by these names, Wilfectin and Wilfect. In various European country, they are approved. They can be used for prophylaxis and treatment. They do not contain any factor eight C. So they have to be given well in advance, almost 24 hours before surgery, to take the advantage of the spontaneous post-infusion factor 8 rise. The real life experience with these products worldwide is small and they cannot be used for emergencies unless with that you give factor 8 separately. Then you have this other product which is synthetic, recombinant DNA technology induced product. Von Willebrand factor is a huge protein and it has got a formidable structure complexity. And that's why the technology to produce a recombinant VWF took a long time and it, as it had several hurdles. But now we have the product by the name Vivendi in Europe and Von Vendi in US. Again, approved. These are highly purified products. These are devoid of Adam TS 13. And therefore, they contain ultra large factors also, ultra large multimers also. Like Desmopressin was inducing these from your body when you're giving recombinant, you are administering ultra large factors. And therefore, you have to be very careful because this can lead to myocardial infarction in a person who's got ischemic heart disease. So, thrombosis incidence after recombinant is as much as with Desmopressin. But this is a good product for type 3 and very severe type 1. Now, why recombinant von Willebrand factor is, should not be routinely used is this cartoon that is showing you. This is plasma derived, this is recombinant, both given in the same dose of 80 units per kg. And you look at the blood loss after the delivery. It was 460 ml when you give plasma derived, it was 680 ml when you give recombinant. Now, so this is the final sort of diagram to tell you what can be used for which type of von Willebrand disease and why you should know the type. So desmopressin is best for type 1. Any sort of plasma constant plasma product containing factor 8 and von Willebrand is best for 2A, 2B, 2M and 2N. As far as 3 is concerned, if there are no LO antibodies, you can use this. But if there are LO antibodies, because 
In factor three, there is not, nothing produced. So it's very, very easy to produce the antibodies. Then you have to use recombinant only. The alternatives are, of course, you can use plasma products for type one. For example, today, we don't have desmopressin. So we use the same plasma derived factor eight and von Willebrand concentrate like coit for type one. Desmopressin can be tried in 2A, should never be tried in 2B, can be tried in 2M and 2N. And plasma concentrate can help patients of type 3. Adjuvant therapy, tranexamic acid, 10 to 15 milligram per kg, three to four times daily, orally or intravenously or topically, is extremely helpful adjunct for the mild mucosal bleeding. This can be used with desmopressin. This can be used with plasma derived factors. They should not be given for patient having gross hematuria because clotting in the ureter can lead to obstruction. Now, because this is a disease of woman, we have to talk about the reproductive health. Von Willebrand disease does not impair fertility, unlike, say, fibrinogen disorders or factor 13 disorders. So, miscarriages do not occur. However, this disease has a very, very negative impact on the woman's health and the quality of life. Every month, menorrhagia and the PPH, which they have to go through. So woman life is, quality of life in a woman with von Willebrand disease of significance is pretty miserable. Among 271 women with menorrhagia without any pelvic disease, 7 to 13% had von Willebrand disease. So it's extremely common cause of menorrhagia when there is no local disease. Oral Estrogen progesterone pills and Mirena are great asset in making the life of these women very comfortable. Desmopressin can be used safely during pregnancy because it does not have any oxytocin activity, but once again, not available. During pregnancy, both factor, von Willebrand factor and factor eight have spontaneous rise, but it drops precipitously after delivery, leading to PPS. So this should be anticipated, prevented and treated. And lastly, this allo antibody development, like hemophilia and Christmas disease, allo antibody can develop in about 10% of patients of type 3. It's very unusual in type 1, type 2, but in type 3, especially after multiple transfusions. Therefore, concentrate containing von Willebrand factor are contraindicated after this complication has occurred because you can die of anaphylaxis. In these patients, Novo 7 can be used. And if you use factor eight, it has to be used as a continuous infusion because there is no carrier protein for it. What's the future? So we have moved from plasma to cryoprecipitate in 60s to intermediate purity concentrates in 1970s to desmopressin in 1980 to single high purity concentrate in 2000 to single recombinant concentrate 2010. This is the worldwide. We don't have this in many places. And therefore, intermediate purity concentrate is the sheet anchor, as I mentioned, from the house, yogurt, coit, and other products. Future, as far as the diagnosis is concerned, you have got NGS, so molecular way of diagnosing this particular entity. You also have gene therapy knocking your door, but as this is a very, very large gene, the work is in its infancy. One thing not mentioned on this slide is interleukin 11 which can also work like desmopressin in inducing the production of your own factor eight and von Willebrand factor. So gene therapy, transcriptional silencing, preventing excessive degradation, gene editing, cellular therapy, compensating factor eight deficiency, increasing von Willebrand level are various futuristic approaches. So I conclude my talk by saying that in past 20 years, there have been very major advances in understanding the pathophysiology, molecular basis and management of von Willebrand disease. The main option available are desmopressin and plasma concentrate. And for us, it is only plasma concentrate of intermediate purity type. And they are best for controlling bleeding, both in prophylaxis and therapeutic setting. And future, there could be recombinant factor eight, factor uh, von Willebrand factor, interleukin 11, and gene therapy. Well, thank you so much. We'll now move on to the panel discussion. And the panel discussion, as I mentioned, is where are we now and where does the future hold? Moderating this is Dr. Cecil Ross, Professor of Medicine, Head Hematology at St. John's Medical College Hospital, Bangalore. And once again, for those who have joined late, let me introduce the panelists. 
We have Dr. Dagjish Chandra, who is Professor of Pediatrics, ESI Model Hospital and PGI MSR New Delhi. Dr. Tufan Dolai, Professor and Head, Hematology Department, NRS Medical College and Hospital, Kolkata. Dr. Mukul Agarwal, Assistant Professor, Department of Hematology, Ames, Delhi. Dr. K.K. Radhika, Associate Professor, Department of Clinical Hematology, Nijams, Hyderabad. Dr. Chepsi Philip, Senior Consultant and Program Director, Regional Advanced Center for Transplantation, Hemolymphoid Oncology and Marrow Diseases, Believers Church Medical College Hospital, Tiruvala. Dr. Hasmukh Balar, Hematologist and BMT Physician at Surat Hematology Center and Kiran Hospital, Surat. Well, thank you so much. And now over to Dr. Over to Dr. Sasu. Thank you, sir. Thank you for that uh, overview, very good overview. And demystifying the, 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 the one willibrance disease. And uh, when you get one willibrance disease, it's probably a nightmare because, like you said, you know, there are not many, always it's not easy to get a fat rate with uh, enriched with one willibrance. The other thing that you pointed out was also that, you know, you, you said that uh, uh, the, the, the frequency with which we see. Um, one will be much less than what we actually see with factor eight or factor nine deficiency. The reason is probably, you know, when I was the, the Federation uh, uh, National VP, you know, we figured out that there are only five or six centers Bangalore, Pune, Bombay, Ludhiana, CMC, and Delhi. And one or two centers here and there which actually can diagnose one will be. Uh, therefore, the disease is primarily predominantly underdiagnosed, despite the fact that it's much more common than, uh, than, uh, than hemophilia A and B. And therefore, if you look at our own national registry, uh, you have only 3% in a large population of 20 and odd thousand people across the country. And that works out about 300 and odd or 400 and odd uh, total number of patients diagnosed with uh, one willibrance. And therefore, a lot needs to be done in the country where you can actually diagnose one willibrance and it's a little complicated and then we will see what the the true uh, field work field level were how do you work at the field level uh, in terms of uh, managing these uh, conditions now i'd like to ask uh, dr Dirdish chandra from delhi in how many patients actually which you have seen uh, you have a positive family history uh, that could prompt in initial diagnostic testing well, uh, uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Rose. Actually, uh, I don't have a very large experience of uh, managing one Wilbrandt uh, disease, but going by uh, the literature, the uh, patients with the one Wilbrandt disease will uh, have a family history in about 50 to 80 percent uh, uh, instances. But as uh, we know that in India, there are uh, limitations about the diagnosis. So, uh, this part is, and this being an autosomal dominant disease, like several times what happens is that if the lady is having menorrhagia in her daughters also, the uh, psychic is going for longer periods. She feels that this is normal as it is normal for her. So the family history is not very easily elicitable, but theoretically it is uh, known to be present in 50 to 80% patients. And so what would you then say, how would you take history, detailed history to prompt a diagnosis that, you know, that we have to look for one willibrance in such patients? The patient that so actually generate, going uh, by the uh, by the other uh, coagulation disorders like factor 8 and factor 9 deficiency, the congenital disorders, the onset of bleeding would be in a younger age that would point towards uh, the diagnosis of uh, uh, these disorders. And... In uh, factor eight and nine deficiency, there is a family history, and that is uh, the uh, kind of uh, in the the uh, oblique transmission that we call, and those history would be available, say, in maternal uncles or uh, these the the male siblings of maternal aunt, etc. So those history would be there, and the type of bleeding that occurs, like in um, uh, uh, one Wilbrand disease, it would be in a younger child, it's mostly the epistaxis which is bothersome. Then subcutaneous hematoma also are known. Uh, hemarthrosis is something which does occur, but in uh, rare uh, uh, type 3 uh, one Wilbrand uh, disease. So that is rare presentation, but then if uh, 
hematosis there and hemophilia has been excluded then probably we are dealing with one urinary disease so going by uh, the uh, presentation in early age epistaxis then as the age increases the mucosa bleeds in girls the menarche and the, at the time of menarche there would be menorrhagia and uh, cutaneous bleeds could be there so these are the manifestation by which and particularly if the screening test for uh, in uh, boys if the screening test for hemophilia are negative that makes this diagnosis a very strong possibility thank you dr jain because that like you said it's the most accurate diagnosis is primarily by history because at least you're suspecting that there's a inherited bleeding disorder especially in the woman and uh, you know you may have all the jazzy tests which you have but the most important uh, screening point is begins with the history and you know the family history the mother the menorrhagia and uh, loss of primary uh, increased bleeding and loss of uh, uh, time of primary dentition uh, and things like that so thank you very much yeah that's because right very yes. critical yeah. to be able so, to uh, actually send patients or refer patients or at least work out towards a, to a diagnosis because it's important to diagnose all of them early but the sensitivity of the history taking is very very critical uh, in uh, such patients thank you sir uh, now i would like to ask dr mukul because he is in delhi and um, given the complexity of diagnosis which dr agarwal has just uh, you know elucidated what do you in your setup would do i mean of course you are in delhi so you have got all the, the technology to be able to diagnose in people but what would you suggest that you know in a smaller place that uh, you know you could uh, suspect diagnosis taking on from what jagdish chandra said so laboratory wise so as uh, all three of you dr agarwal dr chandra and you yourself has pointed that history and examination are like key to reaching a you know sus good suspicion in such a scenario if the patient is having bleeding symptoms with or without uh, significant family history you know many a times uh, at least in my practice we have uh, received patients who just give that the father or the mother the father is having hemophilia and uh, you investigate the patient and they are having plated kind of bleeding and uh, you have a suspicion of vwd and you just feel that the maybe the parents were wrongly diagnosed as hemophilia as well all those things are a reality at least in our practice uh we need to be careful of all these scenarios so whenever we have a suggestive history we go for a coagulation profile which consists of a prothrombin time aptt platelet uh, platelet count and fibrinogen assay if any of these suggest a possibility of uh, uh, usually we see a prolonged aptt in case of vwd if that's not there and the patient has significant bleeding history we go for a platelet function test which is now more increasingly available at uh, at least at uh, tertiary centers this gives a clue to the towards the diagnosis of vwd and uh, at least a antigen test can be done which is more commonly available nowadays uh, at various places uh, a bleed a uh, bat score or a bleed assessment tool uh, can be used in the clinical practice to uh, screen the patients who who require evaluation and uh, subsequently for advanced tests including recoff and uh, uh, collagen widening assay which are not available routinely at most of the places including at aims uh, these can be performed at specialized uh, laboratories and uh, you know within appropriate uh, turnaround time of a week or two weeks uh, the results are usually available but at, uh, a good history at least a good screening uh, a good suspicion and uh, a screening kind of a, a strategy helps in diagnosing most of the patients in uh, most of the patients yeah i agree because uh, some majority of places like i told you if you do like it uh, one urban is diagnosis it's highly highly under diagnosed given the prevalence of yes. 3% it's highly under diagnosed so so when we had a if you take actually a college because we had done that some time ago that if you take a college uh, women's college and you ask them the history of menorrhagia how many of them have many people actually have menorrhagia if you actually look at the pictorial uh, graph if you give them and then you show them your normal pads how often they how often it looks like a full pad or half pad or just a spot in the pad and things like that we found that at least for 20 to 30% of these women in uh, women's colleges had menorrhagia by a pictorial representation of the, the problem the question is 
whether how many of them actually have mild one malignance because that requires a lot of money you know, because you know at least you need to do a factor uh, eight antigen and then figure out whether they are mild one malignance so on so at that time we did not get a funding but uh, you know we, we we know that uh, it's a big problem especially if you look, look at and 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 like dr jadhi was saying that you know mother has menorrhagia she child complains of menorrhagia she thinks oh it's all for the game so they don't realize that actually that what is the bleeding is actually more than uh, what normally many women would uh, do and therefore i think that the simpler thing would be to still do that. suppose especially if it's not in a childhood but at least in uh, adolescent young that if you have a atcc that's prolonged and you have a bleeding time if you don't have a great function of pfa and that's not easily available in most of the places it is do a bleeding time and the bleeding time is slightly more like for a four second or four minutes or so but it is five or six seconds more or less you are sure that this person may be having a one volume disease and subtyping may be taking time because again those uh, things quite uh, cost quite a lot so so i think that still good old thing what we used to do like what the doctor agarwal was saying that you have a patient who's got a bleeding history who's got a pt that's prolonged with led and uh, history that uh, dr jindal was saying that all these points are taken and then you have a bleeding time that's prolonged you know it's a diagnosis of one malignancy and then afterwards just for further at the time of pregnancy or uh, delivery or surgery and things like that then you probably can work out uh, you know what exactly they have uh, because it has implications on uh, treatment so coming to radhika uh, what would be your approach supposing a woman like is predominantly we see a lot of women who got puberty menorrhagia what do you think uh, should go how do you go about people children who come in adolescent puberty menorrhagia thank you sir thank you for the opportunity uh, as agrawal sir has said the most common cause of uh, pubertal menorrhagia around 10 around 15 to 20% of the pubertal menorrhagia cases are diagnosed von willebrand disease so once uh, a child who presented with puberty menorrhagia has been diagnosed von willebrand disease uh, then the management go this way sir menorrhagia is the most common symptom as we all know of, the, of a pubertal girls with von willebrand disease occurring in almost 80% of the cases uh, so uh, what is most important is a multidisciplinary approach which includes a gynecologist and a hematologist there are multiple modalities for management of pubertal menorrhagia in von willebrand disease which includes hormonal and the non hormonal therapies among the non hormonal therapies what we have are the anti fibrinolytic agents like tranexamic acid most of the times it's used uh, it's you it can be used in isolation or most of the times it's used as an adjuvant to hormones or to other therapies the second most important non hormonal therapy is the desmopressin uh, which is a synthetic diuretic a synthetic derivative of adh hormone right now presently not available with us either given in isolation or in combination with anti fibrinolytic agent so these are the two non hormonal agents available for pubertal menorrhagia with von willebrand disease among the hormonal treatment how we go ahead the the various hormonal Uh, strategies available are the most common is the combined oc pills sir most commonly used are the sequential oc pills comprising of the estrogen and progesterone started on day 5 of the menstrual cycle continue for 21 days then we have the progesterone only contraceptions most common is the primolut given at a dose of 15 to 20 mg per kg body weight uh that's the most common what we commonly use with us given uh, i mean Uh, the other uh, hormonal therapies available are the injectable progesterone injections sevista sevista is a ornithoxifin which is a non hormonal non steroidal agent used for used to suppress ovulation and uh, therefore as uh, used as a contraception in pubertal menorrhagia and uh, so there are agents like oc pills combined oc pills then we have progesterone oc pills then we have injectable progesterones people don't respond then we explore danazon which is an estrogen stimulant people don't respond to all these oral medications then we have the option of mirina uh, not commonly used but used in resistant cases this is the progesterone intrauterine device which causes a sustained release of progesterone intra in the intrauterine cavity uh, it uh, has a good response rate it can be kept in situ for 5 years but one of the most common complication with mirina is a pelvic inflammatory disease causing a secondary infertility so unless a, so 
this is generally reserved for patients who don't respond to the above, above mentioned management. Hello? Patient does not respond to all these agents like Primolot, Ocipil, Danazol, Sevista, Merina. Then uh, some of the last uh, resort management strategies are the ovarian ablation, ablation or the hysterectomy, which are generally considered after the, after the child finishes her family. So generally we reserve this ovarian ablation and hysterectomy to the last after the child completes her family. Uh, the other option apart from this hormonal and non-hormonal therapies are the factor concentrates. There are some studies which shows that factor concentrates starting on day one of the menstrual cycle given for five days can, right, can uh, significantly control the menorrhagia for that particular cycle. So we can give like prophylaxis five days every month during the menstrual cycle with factor rate one will concentrates and uh, control the bleed. So these are the management strategies for hormonal, non-hormonal, and the third line is the factor concentrates. And the last resort is the surgical management with either ovarian ablation or the hysterectomy. So this is how we manage. So in Nizam's Institute, the protocol how we go is if we are, I have a pubertal woman, pubertal menorrhagia case, diagnosed case of one wilburn disease, we first initiate her on primolid, try for a month, no response to primolid, we initiate her on OC pills, no response to OC pills, then we explore Danazol and Sevista. No response to these medications, then we introduce a Merina in her. No response to Merina, then uh, we consider a factor, uh, factor rate one will win prophylaxis once every month. No response to that, probably the last resort. We haven't done, but probably we can think about an ovarian ablation or a hysterectomy. This is how we approach a case of pubertal manorrhagia in a case of one will bring this is there. Thank you. It's quite, uh, quite uh, complicated and quite challenging. So what we normally do is we would uh, give them progesterone alone for two, three months and they usually respond. I mean, we start with uh, primarily twice a day, twice a day and then once a day and, uh, you know, primarily two times, three times a day and then they usually respond. The point is that when you keep giving progesterone, progesterone they're quite happy, you know. The other thing is also, I think is very, very important is to also have, also have to replace them with a lot of iron, oral iron, uh, because when they bleed, they have at least good iron reserves so that the hemoglobin doesn't fall precipitate. So sometimes what happens, we forget to, uh, you know, give uh, factor eight and uh, factor one with the and OCPs and all, but we forget to give iron in these people because they are chronically iron deficient. So give them adequate amount of iron so that even if they bleed, there's adequate iron stored because their retica is quite good at the time of uh, period. Once what happens is that you keep on giving them progesterone to around six, eight months, 10 months later. And then they'll have a breakthrough bleeding because whatever progesterone you give, how much progesterone you give, they just have a breakthrough bleeding because the, the endometrium goes to atrophy. At the time, intermittently, once in three months, four months, you have to give them estrogen uh, progesterone combination for two, three months. And again, shift them back to uh, primary root again. Otherwise, they develop thrombosis and also to prevent the Direct through bleed because you know once you are starting a puberty menorrhagia on uh, OCP, you are committed to long term OCP. You know till such time she gets married and things like that. So therefore, you give three four months primary change over to OCP or I mean, estrogen containing to see that the endometrium again starts proliferating, and then two three months later again go back to uh, primary so that you know you have a smaller thinner endometrium so that their periods are manageable. And that's how we go about it. I mean, I think the one month, uh, if you don't have much of uh, effect, I think you have to increase the dose of progesterone because it's much, much safer than uh, estrogen in these uh, people. And of course, the other problem is we have been tempted actually to sort of give over an ablation, but they develop uh, menopausal symptoms so <laughs> badly. So it's better to do an endometrial ablation rather than, you know, an ovarian ablation because some gynecologists do some balloon, uh, uh, you know, some balloon procedures. Uh, which they actually knock out the endometrium. So, so that is another thing that uh, you know you're like saying, Marina, and you know, ultimately you have to do a hysterectomy. And you no, know, we have done only one because uh, it was horrendously difficult to manage. Her. And the other thing is like you're saying that there is no. And what Agarwal is saying that uh, you know there's no much adequate factor uh, eight with one vulnerable is available freely. You know that's uh, free and far between. So you really have to struggle to, to manage uh, patients with uh, women with puberty uh, menorrhagia and or, you know, the normal menorrhagia they will be getting. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Radhika. The next we thing have is, one, yeah. 
can i just okay. interrupt yeah, yeah. we have we have, a, we have a 19 years female miss santosha yeah. she case of one willbin disease who had this refractory menorrhages so we have explored primal otocepal danazol sevista right now we have inserted marina 2 years back it okay. worked for okay. one and a half year and again now like she's back onto her uh, menorrhagia so we have been discussing with uh, daily i mean very frequently we have been discussing with the gynecologist the next options and all so this is how she has counseled it she has inserted a marina one and a half year it worked again it has given a way so we were is in a conversation no other, about there no other maybe, maybe there no other uh, intra she has a large intra ovarian she has a large ovary ovarian cyst she has a large ovarian cyst no no she has but, an uh, ovarian the, the uterine uh, no fibroid microfibroids and things like that of the she because no sir, she doesn't have any fibroids fibroids how much you may the, they will continue to bleed and bleed you know even if the small subjects of fibroid that may be the causing the problem so sometimes even endometrial i mean from uh, yeah you can do a endometrial ablation only of the fibroid through the Uh, provaginal root it is a small submucosal or something because the, the yes. uterine contraction in those situations because especially we got uh, uh, you know so much of bleeding and not responding to those bleeding it will be a mechanical problem she has an ovarian see whether the finer imaging studies would suggest there will be some submucosal fibroids which are amenable to treatment she has an ovarian cyst which can so cyst is basically because she is bleeding and uh, bleeding like, and uh, yeah so that will be there that so ovarian cyst to... is because it's a follicle blood blood so it uh, bleeds and then you have a cyst so these people have multiple ovarian cysts uh, that is a uh, problem with uh, every time you have a period that they will bleed and they'll have a pop pop point there the point is that you are saying vaginal bleed predominant vaginal bleed and not respond to all these things maybe you need to look at a finer imaging study maybe ct scan or something like that to find out whether there is a uh, fibroid or subcutaneous fibroid that tiny teeny tiny small fibroid maybe a good uh, dnc and you know what the uterine uh, fibroid uh, remove the fibroid maybe worthwhile uh, rather than because yeah. you already tried you are saying very very na and all that we have tried very na also so sir then, we have stuck up in that yeah. case so right you, now you you probably need to go to a good imaging Uh, at lady to see if there is any sub mechanical problem is there of some sort and then of course if it is not there it's not there and we should have to do a hysterectomy again uh, to do a hysterectomy to under cover yes. what have you tried a combination of uh, uh, ocps with uh, it's a uh, tonic mic acid or uh, our, com com our gynecologist uh, yes sir, we both have been managing together gynecologist and myself we have explored yeah. all this we have been she has been under a follow up for the last 3 years okay so okay. we have been exploring all this medication she has an ovarian cyst she got admitted twice for hemoperitoneum managed for hemoperitoneum with factor concentrates and cryo and all Probably came out of that hemoperitoneum now like uh, again three, we are yeah. back to the menorrhagia okay. maybe type 3 maybe you try thalidomide uh, <laughs> i don't know try thalidomide but you know it's, it's a problem it's a problem so Uh, you know, you just push the wall, and you know you have a problem. I think you look at uh, the mechanical problem. You know, uh, some small teeny fibroids here and there, and then see whether that is amenable to treatment. That might solve the problem. Uh, so, 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 uh, Hasmuk, you are uh, uh, in Surat, and Surat has got a very good uh, hematology center, uh, hemophilia center, and one of the best in that part of the I mean, Western India. So, how do you manage uh, surgery in your uh, patients with Cornwall disease? yes sir uh, uh thank you for uh, inviting me uh, basically uh, uh, surat has a wonderful center as you said yeah, yeah i know unfortunately uh, i am not yeah. i am not attached attach with this hospital it is a government institute yeah. uh, but uh, uh, anyway so uh, in in india in surat we have a uh, limited options like uh, uh, desmopressin uh, ffp cryo uh, factor 8 concentrate include uh, that include one willibrand we don't have a purify one milligram factor or uh, recommended or plasma derived so if uh, already dr agrawal sir has mentioned that if there is a minor procedure like dental excision uh, and uh, lepro uh, laparoscopic uh, biopsy uh, city guided biopsy then uh, uh, in type 1 and type uh, 2a desmopressin uh, will help so but it is again it is not uh, available easily uh, so in the uh, uh, practically we only left with the uh, plasma uh, plasma derived uh, uh, factor 8 including uh, one willibrand factor so 
what we do uh, uh, we'll do we'll do the baseline uh, uh, pt aptt majority time uh, uh, that will give idea that if pt is a uh, prolonged like 50 60 then we'll keep a target that if it is a normalized then the hemostasis will achieve so before the uh, any surgery 12 hour before we'll give a uh, like a, a 15 minute per kg uh, factor 8 concentrate that include the one billy brand and uh, uh, we'll we'll do we'll repeat the uh, same dose after the surgery and uh, subsequent three uh, will give a, a once a day dose for three to four days to keep the factor eight more than 50 percent and uh, uh, if there is a minor surgery like a dental extension or biopsy so a single dose is a uh, sufficient uh, to keep a uh, hemostasis and uh, uh, if there is a major intra-abdominal yeah uh, any uh, uh, intracranial surgery then uh, we'll routinely give, uh, keep uh, we'll give a once a day factor eight uh, for three to four days uh, oh, sorry for five to seven days to keep up uh, this factor eight level more than 50 percent yeah because in surat i think uh, the, the the government hospital there uh, when they have the intending processes they actually ask for a small amount of plasma derived uh, or intermediate purity factor to be able to take care of the one will be because if you always take factor eight recombinant or factor nine recombinant uh, and yes, FIBA and O7 for the inhibitor patient, it's always worthwhile to have some amount in their in their inventory. Uh, okay. purity factor eight, uh, it's available now in Baxter makes you make and uh, other people make will eight or two eight and things like that. It's available in India, okay. and those are uh, uh, you have to take those intermediate purity factor and then. Uh, uh, manage these uh, smaller group of people who are difficult to manage and you know you can the other reason why you need to have one willibrin rich um, factor eight is also because when you are trying to give prophylaxis to children and that is quite common and so that's what uh, the video was saying if they can use the factor eight uh, enrich one willibrin as a prophylaxis for children with hemophilia uh, so that they develop the chance of developing it much less than compared yes. to use the the recombinant alone and therefore it's worthwhile to have some moment water because you have a straight patient walking in with puberty membrane and then you can use that intermediate purity factor or factor eight uh, enriched with uh, one well and that will be useful and therefore it's always better when you're doing intelligent processes uh, for the government and other things to have at least 20 percent of the total amount of uh, factor that we use to be able to have intermediate purity factor plasma derived to be able to take care of these uh, patients because you know sometimes they are useful uh, next uh, dr philip what are the other adjuvants uh, that you would normally use in these patients i mean you have got factor you've got uh, you know, ocps and things like that so how would you use uh, uh, adjuvant hemostatic patients in your practice so thank you, sir, for the question. And I thank Dr. Agarwal for hosting this show. So like I, I, I have to accept that my experience is not very vast like you, sir. I think you would have managed much, many, many more cases over these years. So my limited experience, what uh, like uh, already mentioned by Dr. Agarwal and then Dr. Mukul also alluded to, even our diagnosis is such a challenge that as part of our workup, the best that we do is just doing a, antigen levels that itself in my center costs 10,000 rupees. So it really limits doing investigations per se. So most of the time we end up uh, just managing with tranexamic acid. That is the best type thing that uh, we offer here. So at uh, maximum of around 20 mg per kg, but we usually keep it at 50 mg per kg. Try to manage it between TDS and uh, four times a day. And uh, I think that's, that's the most we have given, but uh, in terms of uh, guidance, uh, you can continue to use sealants. You can use glue agents, depending on the mucosal bleed. Uh, you can use that as adjuvants. But uh, most of the time, you need a primary treatment also for all these uh, parts to be effective, like Dr. Radhik already mentioned, use of progesterone, OCPs, for, to control the uh, menorrhagia part of it. Probably the addition of uh, adjuvants like tranexamic acid might be of benefit. So my experience is very limited, I think. I'd like to listen to what your options would be. Yeah, so, so, so very useful, like you're saying. I mean, you know, the, the use of uh, tranexamic acid or uh, epsilonic acid, now probably tranexamic acid. Children or adults who bleed, 
especially in the oral cavity. Okay, and because the saliva has got a lot of fibro, uh, fibro, fibrinolysis because you, you just, uh, you know, so when you, when you have deep, uh, bleeding in the gums, they don't, uh, they don't clot because the normal fibrinolytic activity of the saliva keeps on dissolving and they continue to bleed and bleed and bleed. If you have a cheek bleed or a lip bleed or a gum bleed, you know, this is a big problem. So what I normally do is to prevent infection because you have to control the gingivitis or periodontitis. So these people have to be uh, advised to give metrogel dental gel front and back to be applied. And when they apply that, you also powder the tonic, I mean the tablet, tablet form of the this thing, and use it as a paste in order to be able to contain the local uh, fibrinolysis that happens, so that the underlying clot keeps on happening, and then there is some amount of healing. So children will have the or adults, you know, it's difficult to bring children, but uh, adolescents, you know, age seven, eight, you can probably tell them and do it for about a month, month and a half and good oral hygiene, use soft toothbrush, and most of the time their gum bleedings and all are, uh, are taken care of. But if they've got a lip bleed or a lip cut or things like that, you have to give them factor because it's just not possible. And sometimes what happens, the dental chaps will suture it and things like that. And that's a major problem again, because unless you have a lot of factor eight, uh, enriched, uh, uh, non-brain enriched factor eight, it's not easy to handle those uh, people, but chronic acid, especially, in uh, mucosal bleeds, in gut bleeds, I mean, supposing a person has got a uh, um, GI bleed because people will take um, NSAIDs and they develop gastric erosion and they come with severe bleeds and things like that. So you have to give them pantodiac, drip and things like that, but also give them IV two grams, three times a day, IV so that the fibrin rises in the gut, in the colon, wherever, you know, uh, it's a thing. The other thing is also the use of tonic acid and gynecological practice. It is very well established. Even people, and, and like Dr. Garol is saying, people with uh, uh, many women with beauty, maybe having one woman smile, one will better than we call them as beauty and then they do hysterectomy. And there's a little more bleed here and there, they will keep getting some plasma and blood and things like that during surgery. That takes care of it. But large number of the DUBs, you know, I think are, and therefore most of these people are married with the uh, pause, uh, you know, tonic acid, which many gynecologists use. And, uh, but only thing is when you have urine, uh, hematuria, you cannot use them because then they will develop clot colic and things like that and there's a big pain. So you, ex ex except hematuria, you can use uh, tonic acid quite liberally and uh, freely, there's no problem at all. And have no problem, and we've used it quite a lot liberally in patients who bleed, and there's no much of a problem in uh, patients who have uh, bleeding with uh, one of these and use of the uh, uh, Coming to the last question, Dr. Tufan, he's a chap who deals with the one of and hemophilia day in and day out. I think they've got a huge hemophilia center in Calcutta, and it's a government recognized center. Uh, which uh, deals with a lot of hemophilia, uh, and uh, so so so, how do you manage uh, to run in your uh, setup uh, in uh, specifically women issues in one with these things? Yes, yes. So thank you, sir. Uh, uh, because the vulnerable disease, you know, it is the underdiagnosed entity. But yes, we have a the registered uh, the risk. There is twenty five percent is there in the vulnerable disease. So in this vulnerable brain disease, particularly the main issues, particularly the menorrhagia, as the hormonal therapy has rightly discussed in my previous speaker. So we have been followed that. Also, we have been mentioned. Initially, we treated with the tranexamic acid. If it is not controlled, then we give the primulatin. If it is not controlled, then sometimes we refer to the patient, the gynecologist for insertion of the coils. And along with that, sometimes if it is not responded, then we are giving the prophylaxis in treating the menorrhagia. Apart from the menorrhagia, if other issues is there, because sometimes the people are presented with only the gum bleed, then only we try to manage with the tranexamic acid per se. If it is not controlled, then we think for giving the factor. Particularly the intermediate purity, the, the immunity is there. That immunity, the, uh, the immunity, we have been given the lower doses. Usually we started with the 40 international unit, and you have to try to give 12 hourly for three to five days. So in case of the major bleed, like the patient has given the hematuria and the deep-seated bleed, then the 60 and then followed by the 40 uh, interest unit per kg, 12 hourly has to be given for at least seven, seven to 14 days. 
and we have a one child is there in that child you are able to control the hematuria even in the 16 to the 17 per kg factor 8 also so sometimes it is very uh, challenging to control the bleeding in case of the von Willebrand disease also so in the omenesu so to summarize the tranexamic acid the hormonal therapy and the intermediate pureated the factor concentrate is the treatment of the choice what to the side so how much uh, factor 8 in your intent do you procure factor 8 with one willingness because you are involved in the intenting in process in the of retrieval yes yes in the intermediate purity usually uh, we procure for depending upon the situation because uh, we have been sent the registered patient and then according to the registered patient, they will be supplied. In general, uh, we uh, advise to give the 200 intervention unit per kg yearly per patient. So this is our okay. rough estimate. Okay. So rough okay. estimate to be given to the government for indenting. Suppose I have a 20 patients, so 20 into the 200 intervention unit per kg has to be procured and should be kept in our store. So depending upon our situation, we have to use it. Okay, good. So there is some kind of a formula that you use to procure because if these kind of things are necessary, otherwise you will find that you are treating only patient if it's factor eight or factor nine, and then an odd patient comes, you know. And the other thing is when you have adequate amount of one blood rich factor, you know, you can use it for prophylax for children also. So I think you know you can have a little more. And I also think that the plasma derived factor would be much cheaper than uh, than I think. I do not know because I don't know the current. Uh, uh, costing in the government sector, but I think that it would be cheaper than uh, recombinant. I don't know. What do you say? Yes, yes, sir. Plasma derived is the available, but the recombinant is not available in our government setup. The plasma derived, the Baxter, the, the Takeda, the immunity things is available yeah. in our system. So the yeah. recombinant thing is not available in yeah, our so, system. So, so one of the important things that I actually want to tell all the people is that you see, when you have a patient, when you have a product that you use for one willpower disease, the product insert must be clearly stating that how much is the one valence factor there. Now, if you have a genetic thing that this is a plasmid, right? So there will be a one valence factor there. And it makes no sense because you should actually have how much is the factor, uh, one valence factor is there in that product. I mean, we have quite a few products in India that uh, do not specify that because they are plasmid, right? You assume that they may be having uh, 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 one valence. So, like oh, Dr. Garal, I had uh, shown a slide where you do uh, solvent detergent, you use filtration, and you use uh, uh, viral inactivation procedures, and so on and so forth. During that process, of the one minute, because a huge molecule, you know, it gets destroyed. So, the, the product insert must specify, and when you are indenting, at least in Karnataka, what we do, we, when we intend the, pro uh, the, the product, we specify that your product insert must actually say, how much of one millimeter is there in the vial? Right, right. So I therefore, said, it is very critical. Otherwise, there are so many products which are cheaper, and they will not mention. And then you assume that they have got uh, one millimeter, one millimeter uh, factor in them. It is not true because uh, you know it's not uh, measured in the in, in the Indian products that we have found. Uh, but, but of course, if you have Immunate or Coet uh, or uh, you have Willate uh, uh, and all these products which are available in India. They actually mention one is to one, uh, you know, that sort of a ratio. So, thank you, Tohan. Thank you very much for, uh, you know, uh, going light on the indenting and the amount of factor that you, kind of uh, thing that you use. And uh, thank you all for uh, the very insights that you have given in the ground level. Uh, and uh, over to you, Dr. Dawa, for demystifying it. And, 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 and the people, the panelists have told you what exactly is happening in their own practices. Uh, over to you, Dr. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Cecil Ross and all the faculty members for this wonderful discussion we had this evening. There are just two questions lying in the question box if uh, any one of you would like to answer. One is uh, from Dr. Niranjan that as per GASH, GASH guidelines, one should not use only factor eight for the treatment of on brand disease. So you want to comment on this comment? Yes, because uh, in one willibrance, you don't uh, not only have factor eight deficiency, but also one willibrance deficiency, one brins factor deficiency, because one willibrance is actually a carrier molecule for factor eight. Now, if you only give factor eight and you don't have one willibrance, it may not, uh, it may not uh, bleed. Therefore, you must supplement it with some amount of one willibrance in the form of adding 
intermediate purity factor or cryo or some some other thing to be able to make it more effective and sure. the second question he wants to know is uh, do you use highly purified or the intermediate purity product containing one is to one ratio of factor 8 to conflict it's always intermediate purity factor one is to one uh, because you well, like the previous question was saying if you have only one uh, factor 8 and uh, recombinant factor 8 which is highly purified I mean, it doesn't have any one volubilance, and the defect is one volubilance. So, so you have to use intermediate purity factor. The other, the other thing which the patients normally would say is, why are you giving me intermediate purity? Why can I have a very pure? So, the purity of blood, you know, is a very complicated and a very sensitive issue on patients. So, so you have to be careful to say what you, what do you mean by in, intermediate purity? Why can't I get a pure thing? So the purity is that the the protein is uh, there in the product, therefore. Well, thank you. So once again, thank you to all of you. And I may just conclude by saying that one, von Willebrand disease is extremely common and underdiagnosed. Number two, as was a question put and then it was deleted, whether all patients where you diagnose hemophilia, they should be subjected to investigation of von Willebrand. Uh, I didn't put that question because it was removed by the person who put it. Uh, that's an absolutely correct statement. Uh, there, there is no way to call somebody as hemophilia unless you investigate for von Willebrand and say that this factor eight deficiency is not associated with deficiency qualitative or quantitative of uh, von Willebrand factor. Unless you do that in all the patients, you will miss it. It's easier when woman or a girl is the patient, but when man is a patient, this is the only way. So your question was quite appropriate. Uh, I uh, answered that question actually. You answered that. Therefore, there yeah. is. Okay, okay. So in between, I didn't see that. Yeah. Uh, so that was as far as the diagnosis is concerned. Second thing about a lot of uh, discussion took place on the treatment. And uh, as far as the adjunct part is concerned, I think we basically use three things tranexamic acid, the oral contraceptive pills, and the Mirena. These have helped most of the patients. And as far as the specific factor is concerned, the only access we have, which is safe and effective, is intermediate purity plasma-derived products. That's it. We don't have anything else. We don't have recombinant here and in large part of the world. And we don't have only von Willebrand factor plasma-derived. We don't have that. So we have only intermediate purity products, plasma derived. And I gave two examples, which are from uh, the host of this uh, uh, webinar, the Fendi and the Coit, both available in the vials of 500 units and 1000 units. And it is uh, virus inactivated by using triple modality, which I mentioned. And it has got one is to one ratio of factor eight to von Willebrand. And these are the one which are quite universally used all around the globe. So with this, you are able to handle most of the patients of the von Willebrand disease in a cost-effective way, giving once a day in appropriate dose, occasionally twice a day, and then you can reduce the frequency and give it for three, four, five, six days, depending upon the type of surgery or the nature of injury. So with that, I think we sum up this evening. Thank you. So, so just, uh, just one small thing which I forgot actually to address. The sisters of patients with hemophilia, they are also female hemophilics. They don't bleed, but they have more periods and they bleed during their uh, deliveries and so on and so forth. So they, so they have to be taken care of. So there was a question that whether you can give um, uh, recombinant factor eight uh, to patients with hemophilia. So some of the women uh, who are female hemophilic uh, carriers, they bleed a lot and to them that can be given. So you look at uh, one woman to between all these women to see whether they have got an antigen or type 1 or type 2, and if they are not, then they are just female hemophilics. We have about uh, 700 or 800 of them in our registry. So, so these are the people who, you know, you are, they are not one of them, they are factor 8, and therefore you can give factor 8, because that question was there, I forgot to. <laughs> yeah, I'm absolutely right. I mean, you have to, in each case, differentiate between factor 8 deficiency, hemophilia A versus von Willebrand. Von Willebrand yeah. You have to. And factor VWF AG, VWF recoff, Ristocetin induced platelet aggregation. These three tests are, I think, Absolutely. available in a reasonably sized town place. Uh, of course, in all the cities, major institutions stand alone. No, sir, there are only 10. 
only 10 cities. You can diagnose, yeah, only 10 or 12. No other place. I mean, there are standalone labs today, so... Standalone, no, but the point is you have to do it fresh, no? that's the problem. You, you can't transfer the sample from Bangalore to uh, somewhere, no? It's not easy. There's transport issues with the samples. There are not many centers sure, that are actually diagnosed. Sure, sure. So once in a way, if they come to those four or five places, you know, because the yes. diagnosis is once in a lifetime. So I think... So right. I mean, this is a diagnosis once in a lifetime. Yeah. It's not uh, difficult to send the yeah. patient once send the patient, diagnosis. Yeah, close by. Uh, Wrong diagnosis is killing the patient or killing increasing the, the morbidity right. and increasing the expenses. So there is no problem at all. I mean, von Willebrand is just one example. There are large number of rare bleeding disorders, large number, huge number, from platelet function disorders to all the rare factor deficiencies to fibrinolytic pathway problems and these patients and combination of factor deficiencies. So these patients need to come to the major center. And it's not difficult at all. It's just the mindset. And then patients come for so many things to cities. So uh, one more diagnosis and then lifetime straightforward treatment is not difficult. So that's it, I think. Uh, if there's nothing else, do we close the webinar? Thank you, sir. Well, thank you and good night. Thank you. Have a lovely thank day. you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Good night.